Ladies and gentlemen, it just is for me now to ask you to give an extremely warm welcome to your hometown girl. Please welcome her to the stage, Magda Sabetsky. Congratulations on the book, Mags. This is an absolutely gorgeous book. It's a fantastically well-written book as well. It's enormously impressive. Before we get started, I'd just like you to, write, uh, to read the opening line from okay. your book, please. Sure. If you had met my father, you would never, not for an instant, have thought he was an assassin. That's got to be one of the more impressive opening lines. <laughs> for a memoir I've ever read. When did your father first tell you that he was an assassin? Um, look, I would have probably been in my late teens. It's one of those things I can't exactly remember because, you know, it's sort of part of the furniture, although it sounds bizarre to say hearing that your father's an assassin was an unremarkable event. Um, but uh, when I asked him what he did in the war, he sort of laughed it off and said I was an assassin. And I was late teens, I never took it very seriously, but it did register. Did you believe him? Yeah, I did, but I didn't quite get the seriousness of it and I, I hadn't really put Poland in its place properly in order to understand um, where Poland was in relation to the Second World War and I'd always thought because all the films I'd seen were about Americans and British soldiers, I thought the Polish war was kind of peripheral, you know, you know that double think that you do. Um, and then gradually over time I started to realise exactly how much Poland was at the heart of the horror and how close my father was to all of that. How was it that your Polish father got to meet your Scottish mother after the war? Um, well, after the Warsaw Uprising in 44, my father escaped through a sewer. The, the uprising was a complete failure. The Russians were meant to come and support the Poles and had urged them to rise up. And the Russians stood on the banks of the Vistula River and watched the Poles be annihilated. It was their way of making sure the most talented people in Poland were all murdered by the Nazis, pretty much, wasn't it? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And it was a land grab, as usual, between the Russians and the Germans. Um, and my father, along with many other combatants, escaped through a sewer. Um, and he did tell me um, several times about what that experience was like, which was pretty harrowing. And then he ended up... Um, he ended up in a POW camp from which he escaped. He was in three POW camps altogether and then... Eventually, um, he was liberated by the Russians. He knew that would be bad news and that he'd probably be executed. But a couple of American fighter pilots got him over to the American lines. He made his way to Scotland, where he met my mother. And then he was being trained to be um, parachuted back into Poland and keep fighting when the war ended. And they met, what, at a dance or they met, something? They met in Dunfermline Glen. Um, <laughs> they were just hanging around. Uh, my mother um, had uh, two other sisters, so there were the three McCarthy girls, who, as I said, they started out with a very plain name, McCarthy, and, and ended up with the curlicued names Sosnowski, Shubainsky and Modjor. Um, <laughs> all, be, all on account of the fact that they were, they were hanging out at Dunfermline Glen, and um, the Polish officers were uh, Catholic, and my family, unusually, was a Scottish Catholic family. And my grandmother took, me, uh, took pity on these poor young men and they were invited back to, you know, play the piano in the parlour and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> of, the, of a very working class family, I have to stress. You settled for a while in Liverpool in England and that's where you were born. Yep. What pictures do you have in your head of Liverpool as a little girl, if, um, any, if any at all? Uh, I really remember Christmas very vividly. It was a white Christmas. Um, I remember, you know, we used to go down to Formby Beach because they're actually quite stunningly beautiful beaches in Britain. They're just cold. Um, and it had quicksand as well, which is <laughs> a little off-putting. Sure. <laughs> Um, but Formby Beach is quite spectacular. There's this huge forest full of natterjack toads and you go through all these sand dunes and then there's a fringe of pine trees and you see the, um, the Irish Sea and the beach through these pine trees. And we used to go every year to collect our Christmas tree. So that's a really vivid memory. But chiefly, my memories are of my grandmother, my mum's mother, Meg. And how was she with you? Oh, she was adorable. Um, uh, as I say in the book, you know, she was my conspirator, um, you know, she was like parental love with the thorn of anxiety removed. Um, and um, she... <laughs> 
how people are relating to that. Um, <laughs> Um, she, you know, she was always baking and um, she was very warm and had a thick Scottish accent. My mother has a Scottish accent as well. Um, but I remember I wet my pants one time and I was terrified of telling my mother and my grandmother said, Oh, not to worry, hen, this will be our wee secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, not anymore, it isn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, my mother did say to me the other day, she said, oh, for God's sake, what are you going to blab about now? <laughs> <laughs> there were two kids, your oldest uh, sister, Barbara, and then Chris, your older brother, and then eight-year interval before you came along. Yeah. Did that mean, though, that you were pretty A much mistake. on your own? No. <laughs> uh, no. I did ask my mother yeah. that, and she said, no, you were a joy. <laughs> But she would um, say that, wouldn't she? She would. Um, yeah, I was very isolated. And, and uh, as I say in the book, fantasy became my friend. And um, I very much lived in my imagination. I was also lonely. I used to crave having a sibling about the, own, the same age as me. But it meant that I really did retreat into my imagination quite a lot. What kind of little rituals did you develop? Well, I was a funny kid. I was, and I'm still the same, um, really sort of bold and gregarious in some ways and then riddled with anxiety in other ways. And I still do it. Um, I have this funny habit of, as someone is speaking, I will count out on my fingers how many syllables until it gets to a multiple of four. So I'm at three there, so I need to say something else so I can get to four or I can't stop. Things like that. <laughs> I know, I don't know why. Well, I do. It's an anxiety relieving technique, but I did all sorts of little quirky things like that. Um, I, I now re feel really self conscious about what I'm saying to you, <laughs> I know, Nana. I'm sitting here counting how many syllables in every sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at me, going, one more, one more, one more syllable. <laughs> Uh, and you're still a bit like that today? Yeah, I still have, you know, um, people sort of want you to have cured the anxiety and depression and it's not sort of really the way it works. Um, you manage it and, um, and I'm not someone who's plagued with it terribly in the way that some people are, but I've certainly flirted with it, um, and uh, if that's the way to put it. Um, and, um, you know, I still, ha I still have my odd, quirky, slightly OCD little habits for sure. I do this myself. I, I name all the US presidents of the 20th century in my head <laughs> as a way of, I don't know, a little hidey hole or something in my mind. That's a very nerdy hidey know, hole. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in there with you? Uh, no look, one. <laughs> people like George W. Bush and it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> what brought the family to Australia? Um, look, the reason that we were always given was the weather. Um, my father, although he came from, I oh know it seems a flimsy pretext to f fly 10,000 miles, doesn't it? Um, my father hated the cold in Britain. It's a very dank cold. And although Poland gets cold, it's a dry cold. And, um, um, but really he had this opportunity. He worked as a textile technologist, which is kind of like a textile chemist for a subsidiary of ICI, so we were flown out. So we weren't typical migrants. We didn't come on a boat. We didn't stay in one of the notorious youth hostels. Um, we had a house, you know. Um, so and it was nylon that brought you out? It was it? nylon, yeah. <laughs> Knickers and, pa and pantyhose. Um, yeah, my father worked in, um, you know, rayon, nylon, all that sort of thing. In fact, he specialised in flammability. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be surprised to know that nylon isn't one of the worst, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Why was getting off the plane at Essendon Airport such a hellish experience for you, Mags? Well, because um, as I've just described, one of the main memories I have is White Christmas in Britain and it had been a White Christmas and we arrived on the 23rd of December 1965. The plane, the door of the plane opened at Essendon Airport and it was 105 degrees in the shade. <laughs> and the, the tarmac was melting and then we had to drive, it would have been over 40, maybe 50 kilometres from there to Bayswater. Well, you couldn't, couldn't even touch the car door couldn't handles. Couldn't touch the car door handles. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we had a very rude uh, introduction to, it was, it was really like we'd just been plunged into hell, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> So, like, it's, everything's baking hot. You can't touch the door handles of the car. You yeah. can't walk on the ground. Yeah. It's just what it's like all the time in Melbourne. Yeah, that was, what, that was, the, that was the picture that we formed. At the first night you had in your house in Bayswater, you, you write you were, the family was troubled by a strange sound. In yes, the there was this strange, eerie, high-pitched sound. And um, my brother and father went to look at the fuse box and everyone was like going, what's going on? It sounded sort of electrical and threatening in nature. And I was sent next door 
and um, this uh, flat, faded little girl sort of opened the door, the flyby door, and I said, you know, what's this noise? And she just went, cicadas. <laughs> We were effing clueless. <laughs> How did your dad take to the heat? My father, as I say in the book, only mad dogs and my father would go out in the midday Australian sun and he wouldn't just go out in the sun, he would mow the lawn in it um, with his Bombay bloomers whistling Polish war songs. It was, it was quite a sight to behold. That was his way of assimilating, <laughs> if you will. At some point your dad decided that you were going to be the smart one in the family. But was he a bit competitive with you about that? Yeah. I mean, my brother and my sister are all really smart, but we relocated here at an awkward age for them. But um, I, I got very good marks um, on my report card in primary school. Um, and then my father decided that I was, I was going to go to university. Um, and um, I may have decided that myself. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> there to fulfil his dreams, really. <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, and, um, uh, and he was. He was strangely competitive. I think because he lost his childhood, you know. Um, um, Poland was invaded when my father was 15 and, and everything changed. You know, before that he had this extraordinary, very middle-class life with his family, going to the ballet and the circus, playing lots of soccer. Um, and then when the Nazis invaded, you couldn't even play soccer. It was illegal. Um, so his life completely changed and he was very academically oriented as was his sister, my aunt Danuta, um, and they used to have a sort of uh, academic athletics. And um, as I sort of describe it in the book, it was, he, he never beat her and then, and then he left the country and it was like he was a, um, a contender who never got to fight the big prize fight. So instead he would beat us, you know, at whatever it was we were doing. What, eight-year-old kids? <laughs> eight-year-old kids, <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's the only dad who does that but or did that. I, no, I can hear people going, yeah. yeah. I don't think parents are always entirely aware of what that thing does to kids when you say, you, you're going to be the smart one. Yeah. Uh, did that make you a bit anxious about Yeah, it made me love? very academically anxious and um, I would sort of fret about... I can remember, you know, those anxiety habits that I have at a very early age. If my marks weren't good enough, I'd have sleepless nights. If I hadn't done my homework, I'd have sleepless nights. And it's a very migrant thing too, second generation migrant thing, classic sort of expectation that, you know, you've come to the new country and, and you will succeed. Um, so was, there was very much that sort of pressure as well. Your dad had a secret book you became aware of in the house, a, a book that was wrapped in brown paper. Yeah. And you were told, rather foolishly, don't ever look in that book. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was it a stack of Polish Playboy magazines <laughs> or what? No, it was called Dni Powstania, which means Days of Uprising. And needless to say, I couldn't resist it. And I peeled back the pages of that book and it was um, all photographs that were taken during the Warsaw Uprising. And um, of the 300 pages of that book, I don't think there's one single building that's not at least partly torn down. And it was in that book that I saw my first dead body. Um, and I, I was pretty young. I was maybe only six or seven. And I couldn't understand it. It was a rotting corpse. And... Um, could, could you tell that's what it was at first? At first, no. I, I, I was, it sort of looked like a head with a hole in it and a hand... And, um, it, it, you know, it, it looked like the Wicked Witch after she'd melted, you know. I, I couldn't really quite get what it was. Um, and as I describe in the book, it became sort of like a solemn ritual to go back. And for some reason, I was absolutely fascinated and drawn to that terrible picture. And I wanted to understand what it was. And eventually I asked my father and he was very dismissive and said, it's a dead body, you know. What are you doing looking at that book? You shouldn't be looking at that book. And... Um, and, uh, and, and the message from him was, you know, that's just part of what goes on. You're silly. You, you shouldn't have looked at it. But to him, it was, it was nothing, you know. This is, it's, it sounds completely nightmarish. How did, you, how, how did you manage the memory of what you saw in that book? Um, well, as I described my father, um, you know, who, who was an assassin during the war, that in some ways growing up with him was like a masterclass in dissociation. And there were allowable feelings, um, courage, bravery, you know, compassion was allowed too, but 
weakness and fear, um, any sort of squeamishness, just just weren't condoned. And so you just learnt to sort of cut off from any of those kind of feelings and, and detach from them really. And it took me, you know, quite a while to learn how to feel those feelings properly and how to reintegrate them. You're being taught to do that at the age of six. Yeah, yeah. And, and it went on. There were other experiences too, like um, as I describe in the book, um, seeing a documentary about the Holocaust and watching it with my father. I must have been about eight or nine. And um, my father recognising one of the streets and saying that was where his family had had their house because they'd been in that part of Warsaw that was rezoned as the ghetto. And I realised with horror that this wasn't something I could easily dissociate from, that, um, that, that my father had really been right in the middle of um, the heart of darkness in a way. And did you ask him about that? No, because um, so I don't was... Don't go there? It was yeah, I, I, it was a documentary about the Holocaust and it was horrific. Um, and as I was watching, you know, bodies being bulldozed into pits, I was, only, I was like eight or nine, you know, and I think a lot of us of my generation were exposed to those kind of images fairly young. Um, and I looked to my father for reassurance because I was beside myself and I saw this flicker of contempt on his face. For whom? For, for, what? for me, for my emotionality. It was very small, it was slight, but it was there. And there was always this sort of thing with my father that um, you had to man up in those kind of situations. Because of course to him, he'd had to perform a kind of emotional triage and jettison a lot of his finer feelings in order to survive that war, you know. There's a picture in your book of you in a tennis outfit and you're what, I don't know, 10 or 11 or uh, 12? 11, yeah. 11 on the front page of the Sun News Pictorial, as it was back then, yeah. uh, doing a backhand shot and you, your tongue's poking out of your mouth and you look, quite frankly, adorable, Max, in that picture. <laughs> Thank um, you. You were, you were, tennis was very big for you. How, how, how hard did your dad drive you when it came to tennis? One phrase to say to you, Eastern European father tennis coach, assassin. <laughs> Your, Make your, of that what you will. Your, your dad was Demir Dokic before <laughs> his time, wasn't he? He, he was no Demir Dokic. He was, he was not mad, but he... Um, <laughs> um, will I get sued for that? Um, he, he, but he was... Um, a lot of his pent-up stuff from the war, I think, bizarrely played itself out on the tennis court. We all have some arena that the drama of our life is family life. It becomes a metaphor. And it's not surprising that someone who'd done what he'd done was an assassin, ended up in a sport where it's all about killer instinct. Is that what he said to you? Yeah, he told me when I was nine I had no killer instinct. And, um, <laughs> and I was wiped in the, in the way that only my father could wipe you. My God, when you were wiped, you were wiped. Was there anyone standing around you to, to go, my God, man, you just called a nine-year-old girl, uh, accused her of not having a killer instinct? Is that um, yeah. um, it odd? My mum tried to sort of stop my father. He was, he was, he thought he was doing the right thing, you know. I mean, he, his mission in some ways was to toughen us up and um, prepare us for life in the way that he understood it. Although he knew we were in Australia and it was a peaceful land, comparatively um, Aboriginal experience notwithstanding, but compared to the sort of, you know, what he'd just come from in Europe, um, it was a tranquil time that we were living in. And, um, but he in some way, uh, I think, was really preparing us to be tough. What did he tell you when you started to put on a little bit of weight? that time? He told me to starve myself because he, um, he his mother was a, an overweight woman. My father was a fat little kid. Um, and when he, he started to lose a bit of weight and then during the war, of course, they were under starvation rations. And then when he was in the POW camp, he lost all the weight and he emerged from the POW camp looking very handsome. Um, and he sort of formed this view. Uh, his father as well was an extremely disciplined man. My grandfather was in the police force and he was um, a judge of Greco-Roman wrestling, which is the gayest thing ever. Um, <laughs> but, but if you saw my grandfather, he was a very strong, very stern, very Eastern European man, very disciplined. Um, and he'd passed on those habits to my father. Um, and um, he was... 
uh, I think he wanted to impart to me, you know, the lesson that he'd learned of how to manage his weight and stop the family curse, as it were. You and I grew up in a similar part of Melbourne, the outer, outer, outer eastern suburbs. Yeah. And part of afternoons was watching I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched, Gilligan's Island oh, and the Brady Bunch. Oh, I going, yeah. <laughs> I, I had a crush on Marsha Brady. When, yeah, me when too. Did you, yeah, when did you realise? <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to be her or kiss her. I was very confused. Um, sorry, what was your question? Uh, yeah, when did you know? That's when the thing. did I yeah. know? I, I, I think the, the moment I laid eyes on Marsha. Um, although it was a very confusing time for me because, as I say, I also did have a bit of a crush on Keith Partridge, but then he was kind of girly. Um, but, yeah, no, that was, that was part of my... Um, it, it, it was just so damn normal, you know, and I had this... I mean, I grew up... To pronounce my name properly, the way my father would say it, is Magda Shubansky. Um, and I, of course, grew up with everyone saying Magna Zabansky. Um, my father, when I was six years old, got a very life-threatening cancer. He had a huge tumour in his leg and um, it was very likely that he would die. He survived it and went on for another 40 years. Um, but there are a lot of... You know, we'd migrated here, we'd left behind all our family. There were a lot of destabilising things, a lot of things that were rocking my boat. And, um, you know, Marsha, she was just solid ground, mate. <laughs> she was something I could rely on. <laughs> tell, tell me how you and until your... Until they cancelled the series. Until but, they cancelled yeah. the series. Tell me how you and your friend Kerry uh, used to practise, get yourself in training for kissing boys oh, when yeah. that day should come. yeah. Yeah, well, that was, that's how every first gay kiss happens, is <laughs> practising for boys. Um, um, and she was, in fact, practising for boys. I, I, I wasn't. Um, <laughs> as I discovered, much to my horror. But um, um, the soundtrack for our pashing sessions was, I was obsessed with David Bowie and the song Sorrow. Um, and um, it was an appropriate, appropriately sad soundtrack because it didn't go well. <laughs> Hashing a girl to sorrow in the yeah, background. Yeah, I know. Uh, Something tells me you're the devil's daughter is the line yeah. for that, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, but seriously though, how did you, how did you, what did you think about all that as all that was going? That must have been incredibly confusing. Um, I was terrified because I, I knew instinctively and I knew even younger than that. Um, that I was attracted to girls, as well as boys, but mostly girls. Um, and I knew instinctively that it wasn't normal, and as I say in the book, that I posed a social identity threat to myself. Um, and um, it was terrifying. Because leso was a real term of abuse. Yeah, it really was. Leso. And it, it is, it, you know, as we were talking earlier in the green room, it's hard to remember now just how terrible it was and how, um, you know, really... It was kind of like you, you were cursed to be called a leso. Lesbians were a real, a real object of hate. hate yeah, hate. and revulsion and disgust. Did you hate lesbians too? Yeah, I did, yeah. And that was, you know, that was, um, uh, that's what's called internalised homophobia, you know, that you interject the message from society and, and you, you know, you believe it yourself. So you were a bright convent school girl with a beautiful poetic imagination. How on earth did you become a sharpie chick? <laughs> well, um, uh, <laughs> one of the girls at the tennis club started dating a boy who was in a sharpie gang, and some people here will remember the sharpies. Um, sort of shaved on top. Yeah, on at it the was. Back. It, yeah, the Conti cardigan, yeah. Um, platform shoes, um, a very strange way of dancing. Yeah, um, it's all that. that. Yeah, that, uh, that character I used to do, Michelle Grogan. Yeah, yeah, yeah and you, you've, your fist would piston up and down in front like you were trying to punch yourself in the jaw. It was and there's a, that yeah, thing as well. Yeah, it's very weird. It's the nuns my, my used wife to will, stop us doing it. My wife will do that as well. There's a certain age of Melbourne, a certain generation of Melbourne women from a certain part of <laughs> Melbourne, if you play Stevie Wright at a party, they'll oh, leap yeah. up and start yeah. Connie dancing. Yeah. And you are um, one of those women, aren't you? Yeah, and it percolated right up into the middle classes as well, believe it or not. What's but sort of, but what's I sort drifted of... into the... I sort of drifted on into the periphery. By that time, I, I really had kind of... Um, partly triggered by my realisation about my sexuality, had plunged into a depression, the first sort of real depression I'd ever had, and it was... Uh, that in itself was terrifying. Um, and, you know, I just was rudderless, and, and my marks at school just fell through the floor. Um, I couldn't study, I couldn't concentrate. 
I didn't know what was going on. No one spoke about that sort of stuff back then. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I say, I was rudderless and I just sort of drifted into this gang, the Croydy Boy Sharpie gang. <laughs> on the periphery, I was, I hasten to add, I was sort of like the ladies auxiliary, you know. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't a fully fledged member at all, you know. I was the blue stocking Sharpie. You know. Did you ever get into a scrag? A scrag fight? Um, no, I nearly did on the train once. I got picked, as we used to say. Can I swear yeah. on this? Um, I was sitting there in my prim convent girl uniform because I was a convent schoolgirl during the week and a Sharpie on the weekends. Um, and uh, this genuine bona fide Sharpie girl picked me and the way I knew I was picked is she came up to me and she said, what are you fucking staring at? <laughs> and luckily for me, the train lurched and she was standing on four-inch platform shoes. <laughs> And have you seen those YouTube clips of supermodels on their platform shoes falling over? She did that all the way back along the, the aisle of the, of the train. And it saved my life. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned there, you got, you got a bit isolated for a while and a bit depressed and you said this is when the, the great hunger started. Yeah. What, what, what form did that take, Mags? Um, I just, uh, sort of about 13 or 14, and it, I'm sure it was um, a, a combination of um, the depression but also hormonal stuff and a, a whole lot of things and, and probably a desire to hide, I think. Um, but when I was about 13 or 14, just this, I was overwhelmed by this voracious hunger and it would wake me up in the middle of the night and my brother was working at the Brockhoff Biscuit Factory at the time. <laughs> That's a diabolical combination. A hungry teenage girl whose brother works in a biscuit factory. Um, and I used to sneak out every night to watch movies in the middle of the night and, um, uh, and, and eat chocolate biscuits. And my weight, as they charmingly say, began to balloon. And it, it, was, um, it was so frightening as well. I felt like there were so many things that I was completely out of control of in my life and that was one of them and, and no one knew what to do about it. Still people really don't understand the mechanisms of why people put on weight. It's, you know, I have seriously looked into this, believe me. Um, and um, um, the biology, the physiology, the mechanics, the emotional, all of those factors are enormously complex. And, and so all of that was going on for me and I had no understanding of what was going on and it was quite frightening. At the end of high school, you got a role in a school production of Salad Days. I did. What do you remember of the feeling of going on stage after all the rehearsals and it's opening night and your parents are in the crowd and people you know are in the crowd and you've got to go on stage and perform? What do you remember of that feeling? Um, it was just this incredible sense of serenity and the certainty that this is where I belong, of homecoming in a sense. Um, and all the diffuse... Uh, confused parts of me congealed into a hole and I, I, I made sense to myself and I no longer felt like an outsider. What did your mum and dad say after that show? Oh, uh, my father... Well, first of all, I looked... I was playing a sort of 1930s dowager and I looked very like his mother, um, <laughs> which must have been really freaky because he never saw his mother again from the age of 20. So it was, would have been very emotional for him as well because once he was carted off to the POW camp, he could never return to Poland because uh, resistance fighters were not made welcome by the communists. So it was very emotional for him to see me there looking and he went, ay, 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 she looks just like my mother. And then the other thing he said, because my father really didn't praise us a lot, but he said, she's got it. That was all he said. Um, and you knew when my father said something like that that he meant it. So it, it was really profound for me. And then my mother, who... My mother is actually the funny one in the family um, and uh, she's hilarious to this day. And um, she said, Oh, Hen, you were very funny. And that coming from her really meant something. So the two of them, they both... They knew that something had kind of happened in that moment. You got into uni in an arts degree and you write, you spent your first term of uni sitting in the student union eating Smarties. Yes. What? <laughs> what? For want of a better idea. I, did, I, I just came from a sort of no account, no account um, um, like Siena College where I went, convent school, um, academically had a great record, but socially, you know, I didn't know anyone. 
Um, and, um, and I was incredibly lonely. You joined the, the Campus Feminist Club. Was that yeah. because for the politics or the vague hope you might meet other lesbians? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Primarily the latter. Um, um, yeah, it's funny that um, the Feminist Club was a club along with the Monty Python Society and, you know, bushwalking. But there, <laughs> there you have it. Um, <laughs> feminism is a nice hobby, ladies. You could take that up later. And gents. Um, uh, but there would have been a lot of uh, lesbians in that group who were pretty uncomplicated and, un and yeah. untortured about their, their homosexuality. There was, there was some... Oh, I think um, most people of an older generation, very few escaped unscathed from societal homophobia. Most of us um, really took a bit of a battering and, and struggled. You know, um, people my age and older really, you know, had a hard time of it. Um, and, but there were some people there who, there, definitely the, there were some people who were sort of role models who were comfortable in their skin and that was incredible to be around. And then I found a bunch of friends who were going through the same journey as me, somewhat tortured, some less, some more than others, but it was in, just incredible to finally feel that I wasn't the only one. You met, met and fell in love with a girl called Jane. Yeah. How yeah. happy were you once you were able to actually do that? Uh, I was so happy. As I, as I say in the book, it's possibly the happiest I've ever been. You know, I was, I was 20 years old, I was working in a women's refuge and I had a girlfriend. Um, I'd, I'd ticked every box, I'd, I was kicking goals. Um, and there's a certain innocence to your happiness at that age because you just think everything's just going to keep on getting better. <laughs> um, and, and so it's an unalloyed happiness. As you get older, it's an alloyed happiness that's tinged with experience and you know things can go wrong and, you know, but when you're young, it's just absolutely pure, innocent happiness. So it was, it was an amazing feeling. Well, you, you were out to some of those friends, but were you out to your family at that point? No, I wasn't out. I was, I'd come out to my sister when I was about 17, my beautiful sister Barbara who's here. Yay! <laughs> Um, and she was gorgeous. You know, that, that made a huge difference to me, but I still hadn't come out to my parents yet. Going off to Europe for the first time, well, since you migrated to Australia, yeah. you stay for a while in Scotland with your mum's cousin, Molly. Auntie Molly. Auntie Molly. <laughs> Auntie Molly. How did she welcome you into the family? <laughs> oh, she, Molly is really, she had this very, this wizened face, you know, and I, I walked up, she lived above the spudgy like in Toll Cross, <laughs> um, seven flights up. She was in her late 60s and I trudged with my backpack up these seven flights. They nearly burst my heart. I got, to the, I got to the top, knocked on the door, opened the door, went inside and Molly just turned around and gave me this vivisecting glance and said, for God's sake, what a weight you've got on you. Where did you get that? Your mother was always bone thin. <laughs> and then she turned back to the television, sucked on her silk cut cigarette. <laughs> and that was the greeting. She was, she was the most hospitable woman, though. She was, despite that, that's the Scots for yep. you. I was raised, my mum's Scottish, they'll, you know. It's a Scottish welcome. Yeah. Enough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Going from there to Poland seemed to um, really undo you a bit, actually, going to Poland. It, it actually did. This is it, early 1980s, isn't uh, it? 82. Yeah, well, I was sort of, you know, um, had styled myself as a, you know, a campus lefty to that point. Um, and... You know, all all the identity, you know, issues that I'd had until that point kind of began to become explained by left-wing politics and I felt reassured by that and contained somewhat. And then when I went to Poland, that was a communist country, it all began to unravel. But it was also the grief of being in the homeland that my father had left when he was 20. He'd seen his sister once since then. He never saw his parents again. My, I never met my grandparents, they'd gone. And there was just this, it, it was the most heartbreakingly sad place, Poland in 1982. There were bullet holes everywhere. There was just, you know, Warsaw, as I describe it in the book, the Polish name for it, Warszawa, is a, a lovely name. But in, in English, it's Warsaw, Warsaw. And that's what it feels like, the nation's war wound. Um, and I, I went to Poland and, and the first place my cousin Magda Zawadzka took me to um, 
was Pavyak, which was, she said, she, I thought maybe we were going to a cafe or something. <laughs> and it's this huge prison where they used to take people before taking them to concentration camps. And as we sat there, the guy read out over the speaker um, messages that people had left. They'd leave written on little tram tickets or cigarette papers. They'd scrawl their last message before dying and then shove it into a hole in the wall. And they'd retrieved all of these and they would read them out. And that was the first place that my cousin took me. And she said, I'm sorry for this, but this is our history. This is your father's history. So I was plunged headfirst um, in, into that history, into that loss, into that gaping wound and hole that existed where my family should have been. Um, plus the sort of ideological ropes that had tethered me were, were just ripped away from me because communist po Poland in 1982 was a brutal place. It was under martial law. It's just after the solidarity crack. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. Um, and, um, and so I felt like I had nothing to tether me. I was also breaking up with my girlfriend, you know. It was just everything was sort of going wrong and it, it sort of plunged me into another depression, to be honest. But back in Australia, you joined Melbourne University Review and you did a production called Too Cool for Sandals. And I know yes. this because this is when we first met. It is when we first met, when we were touring in Adelaide mm -hmm. and we met the Dying Anthony All-Stars at um, a nightclub. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. You, very kindly, your group were selling out the place in Adelaide and we were getting four people. You gave us a little cameo <laughs> and we did a bit better after that, which was kind. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, I do remember you very... You and Michael Veach as part of that review and I do remember you very vividly because after, and afterwards you were... I don't, you probably don't realise, but there was a certain amount of cachet amongst the Tim and Debbies in the crowd uh, about you. They're going, to, well, I quite liked Magda Zrubanski, actually. I thought she was excellent on stage. She was really <laughs> funny. People were going, Magda, yeah, Magda. Yeah, I thought Magda was quite good. Yeah, I thought she was good. That's, there was a kind of cool vibe around you. Were you, were you aware really? of that at the time? I've never been cool in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I wished I'd known. Oh, could have got a root. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Always missing the boat, you know? Honestly, if you couldn't have hooked up with another lesbian in that venue at that time, <laughs> you mustn't have been trying hard at all. No. Uh, but I do remember that. And from that, you got invited to be part of The Degeneration and a whole lot of other shows coming from that and Fast Forward as well. And um, you created characters like Lynn Postlethwaite. I always thought there was a real camp sensibility with someone like Lynn. Well, well, I didn't actually create her. She was originally created by John Alsop and Andrew Knight and I performed her. And, I, you know, I certainly took a very particular um, angle in terms of the style of performance and the look of her. I'd seen a woman on the tram who looked like her, <laughs> believe it or not. It looked, like, it looked like she'd done her makeup in 1940 and then just reapplied it constantly <laughs> since. Um, and I, and I went to Jürgen Zielinski, who was the makeup artist at the ABC, and described to him, and we had it down pat, right down to the, her rouge instead of rouge ladies, you'll get this one, was just lipstick that was like smeared. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and that was the beginning of, of something that um, was a real feature of my development of characters, actually, is working with makeup artists, uh, Jürgen Zielinski and then Barb Cousins. Um, because I very much work from the outside in. I'm, I'm, because I am sort of a shy show-off, the shy part of me only really feels liberated, um, although that, that's changing now because I'm middle-aged and I'm more comfortable with myself, but when I was younger, um, that mask of having a character to hide behind very much allowed me to be more playful. Um, and that was how a lot of my most well-known characters developed. Tell me how Gina Riley, once you started working with her, forced the issue a bit with you oh, one night. Gina, who I hated on site. <laughs> hated we, on site? We hated, yeah, it's in the book and the tabloids went crazy over this. Gina, I think it's hilarious. Um, I said in the book that I hated her on site and she hated me. Um, I thought she was a crass show off and she thought I was a stuck up snob and we were both right. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, pri we also both pride ourselves on being very bad judges of character. I'm a terrible judge of character. I know you're not supposed to say that, but I am. But, um, but Gina was one of the first people outside of my little uni group who, um, she just flat out asked me if I was a lesbian. Um, and, um, and I was sort of flabbergasted and then relieved really. But Gina just had that disarming way about her because um, the reason it was okay was because it was so patently clear that she didn't care. And, and I just felt very comfortable around her because of that. There was, my, this is probably my favourite sketch from Fast Forward, and I think you were a part of it, I can't quite remember, but 
I, I think the premise of the sketch was that Melbourne was going to have a straight Mardi Gras. Yes. <laughs> and there are a bunch of gay people standing around watching the straight people going, yay, on a float. <laughs> going down Swanston Street and, and, and gay people are watching them and they're going, well, I suppose it's all right so long as they don't shove it down our throats. <laughs> was that you? Yeah, that was us, yeah, yeah. And, and where did you get that line from? Um, oh, well, I don't know if I... Oh, I can't remember if I wrote that line or not. I certainly was a part, a part of that sketch, but um, my father did used to say that over the years, you know. As so many parents used to say what would be deemed sort of homophobic things now, they just said them casually. They didn't really realise or get it, you know. But he used to say, I don't care what they do as long as they don't try and shove it down my throat. Little realising. <laughs> I don't think they will, Dad, you know. I don't think they will. You've got to live in an apartment in South Yarra, and there's a story there about how you were woken up at 6 a.m. one morning. Just tell me what happened that morning, Bags. Oh, that was an extraordinary morning. Um, I was sleeping with the window open, and um, I just heard this bang, and it was a noise like nothing I'd ever heard before, and then there was a woman screaming like no other scream I'd ever heard before. And it turned out that what had happened was some, there was a racing car driver and his wife who lived diagonally opposite and someone had put a bomb at the foot of their bed and this bomb had gone off and it was, you know, right opposite where I was living. And um, I just immediately rang the fire brigade and then ran out um, because all I was thinking is, you know, um, cups of tea, blankets, buckets of water, just any, you know, there's other people in other flats that might need some sort of help. They might want to come back to my flat for a cup of tea or, you know, just do something. And, um, and no one else ran out. There was about five of us. It was in South Yarra and um, it was eerily quiet. And then, oh, you know, it's hard to discuss this actually, to be honest, but there was this wall of flame and the man came out. He'd had his feet blown off and he came through the flame with his hands to his head, completely on fire. Um, and he stood there for about two minutes talking to us and we were just yelling at him, just throw yourself over the balcony. Um, and he was too far gone and he just asked after his wife and wanted to know that she was all right. And then after some time, he slumped and fell behind the balcony and died. Um, and it was just all silent you know, I'd never seen someone die before, except in a movie, but of course there was no soundtrack and it was, it was, it was the worst thing I've ever seen, bar none. Um, and, um, and then later that day, you know, I had to go to work to film Degeneration filming comedy sketches and it was the most bizarre juxtaposition. And, and really, I don't think anyone quite understood and I don't think I quite understood what I'd seen and, and how I was traumatised. I, I, I knew I felt very weird and, and um, upset about it. And, and what happened when you rang your dad and told him about what you'd seen? Well, there was no one I could really tell who'd seen anything like that. Um, there was no one... I, I felt suddenly like I wasn't in quiet, safe Melbourne anymore and I didn't know who to talk to who'd seen anything like that except my father. And I rang my father and he said... Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And he said, well, you just have to put it behind you. During the war, I saw the Jews throw their children into the flames and jump in after them. You just have to put it behind you. And that was his lesson in how you dealt with those kinds of situations. But it also, yet again, it was that feeling of, um, even when I experienced something, and this is classic second generation kind of stuff, that nothing you experience um, feels like it, I don't want to say rates because it's not a scale or a hierarchy, but compared to what your parent has been through, everything you're going through, even something like that feels diminished somehow. And so you're left with this strange um, sense of, of not knowing what you have the right to feel. Um, the insignificance of your own feelings. The insignificance of your own feelings mm. um, and 
this strange sort of shadow sense of realising that it's, it's a small example of what your parent went through and figuring out how you fit in relation to that. It was it was it was a, a really quite disturbing event, and, and I, I never found out that the courts never found out who did it or why. Um, I saw occasionally interviews with the woman who'd survived. Luckily, like, I can't I can't remember her name. I'm afraid, but she looked like she actually went on to have a happy life, which I was very pleased to see. But it was um, yeah, it was a, it was a horrible event. Yeah. So in 1997, you bought a camcorder, and you went around to your parents' house and you sat your father down and you interviewed him about what actually happened to him and what he did during the war. Tell me, tell me how that unfolded, Max. Um, well, I'd heard the stories for years, you know, snippets, little fragments that I'd sort of pieced together. And um, I knew that my father was on the right side. I knew he'd been fighting the Nazis and I knew that my family had hidden Jewish people because my whole family were involved in hiding Jewish people, my grandparents, my aunt, my uncle, my father. Um, and I knew that, but I couldn't make sense of, given that my father was on the good side, I couldn't understand the guilt and shame. There was this, it was, it was palpable uh, and I felt like I was carrying that guilt and shame as so often happens for the next generation. And um, and I tried to make sense of it. And I started to worry if my father had in fact been a collaborator because that was the only kind of explanation out there in the suburbs in Melbourne, 10,000 miles away from where it had all happened with just snippets to go on. I put two and two together and came up with five. And, and, and I was terrified that perhaps my father had in some way collaborated. And, I, and much as it was absolutely terrifying for me to sit down with that, camera and film him, I had to know what he had done. And so I, I, I asked him permission uh, and I told him that at some point I might want to tell his story. And before we began filming, he said, I will speak of this once and then never again. And then he spoke for the next six hours about his life in Poland during the war. What did he remember of when the war came? Because World War II starts pretty much when Hitler invades Poland. What does yeah. he remember of that invasion? Um, the first thing was that the first Germans that entered Warsaw, one of them slapped his face. Um, there were two guys in, they were travelling on a motorbike and they asked directions from my father and my father said, ich weiß nicht, and the German slapped his face. Um, and then the bombing started and the, the planes and um, um, a bomb landed near my father and my grandfather were out just in the hall, in the front door of the apartment block and um, a limb was flown, flung through the air and landed near my father. Um, and he used to speak, he, he, the way he would talk about the war was a strange combination of there would be the guilt and the shame thing and then he would change gear and it would be um, like a boy's own adventure. And I'm sure there are many people here whose fathers or, or grandparents fought in the war and felt that same sort of schizophrenic dissonance. Um, so um, for him, you know, part of it was initially an excitement. He said they used to go up onto the top of the block of apartments and watch the dogfights between the Polish and the German planes. How was he brought into the resistance? Um, well, he started when he was 15 or 16. 15 or 16. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, that was what I spent decades unearthing was exactly what he'd done. And, um, and this is sort of what the book reveals gradually. Um, that he had his own, what he called his personal army. He joins and the Polish Execution Squad, Unit 993-W, Revenge Company. Yeah, Kompania Zemsta. Um, what was yeah, that role? He, was, he was recruited at the age of 19 by um, his brother-in-law, my uncle, Andrzej Zawadzki, um, to be a part of this counterintelligence unit that was there to protect the HQ of the Polish underground. It was this top secret. No one knew of its existence. That they, there were rumours of it. People knew of their actions and saw the results of it. Um, but no one knew who, the, who they were. Um, and their job basically was to execute Polish traitors who were telling the Gestapo secrets of the resistance. But these Polish traitors were also telling the Gestapo where Jewish people were hiding. Was he a sniper? No. No, it wasn't at long range. They would, um, the traitor would be tried in absentia by an underground court 
Um, and then um, my father's unit would conduct surveillance on them. And then when the moment was right, they would run in, read them the charges of which they'd been found guilty, and then at point blank range, shoot them. Shoot them dead? Yeah. Yeah. This was his role as an assassin? Yeah. How did he talk about killing? The business of actually pulling the trigger and... Yeah, sorry, I'm feeling a little bit emotional at the moment. Um, He had found a way to discuss it that was um, very objective. He, he, he brought no emotion to it. He had shut the door on it a long time ago. Um, as I describe in the book, Mum told me um, after the war, he was 19 when he was in that unit and he was even younger than that when he began killing. And um, when he was older, he realised the complexity of it. He said, you know, as he said, when I was young, it was black and white, you were either a pole or you were scum. And um, as he grew older, it began to haunt him. And after the war, he used to beat his breast and say, I'm so guilty, you know, because he, he realised, as he told me later, that there was no knowing with these people who he killed um, what pressure they'd been under. And generally, that means torture, had they been tortured or, you know, with their family threatened or whatever. Um, but essentially he had to kind of shut the door on the past. Um, I think in some ways there are, you know, I just think, you know, he thought he was doing the right thing. He was a young patriot. He was full of testosterone and idealism like young men are. Um, and... As he said to me, one of the reasons he started doing what he was doing, his best friend, Vatsek Goldfarb, was a Jewish boy. And my father said, I couldn't stand what was happening to the Jews. He said, when I saw what they were doing to the little kids, he said, I couldn't stand that. Um, so, you know, he came from the right place about it, but it came to torment him to some extent later on, once he realised what he'd done, when he realised that he couldn't undo it, and when you realised how utterly grey and morally ambiguous the world really is. And did you feel proud of him or ashamed or both or, um, or was it just too big, Mags? Yeah, I don't feel ashamed, but I did. That's why the book's called Reckoning because I, I really, and it has taken me this long and I've hidden to some extent within the world of comedy not going near these things because to be honest, it took me years of therapy to unpack all of this. Um, but... Um, it really, I, I think I came to that realisation that there are some things for which you just, you never find a neat answer and you have to learn to live with the ambiguity of it and you have to learn to live with the discomfort of um, not knowing, what is it that I, I, I look, I, I feel very proud of my father in a lot of ways, but my heart breaks for him in other ways that, that he... Um, he was just a boy. He was just a boy. And you look at so many people now who are, you know, doing the same sort of thing. Um, and I think, what would I have done in that situation? I you don't, don't know. know. Don't know. Like, you talk about a conversation you had with him over the phone. It went for several hours, went way into the night. Yep. And he said the most remarkable thing, I'm just going to quote you here. He said... All my life I have been terrified that one of my kids would grow up to be a traitor. Did that make any sense at all to you at the time? No, it was about two months before he died and we had these conversations and they would just spiral deeper and deeper and, and I found them incredibly destabilising but I, I wanted to be there for him. Um, and um, he made this remark... And it was so kind of wacky. I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Um, and it took me quite some time to really understand that um, he was training us, toughening us up, not to be warriors so much, but his concern was that there was, I call it the stone of madness because it was like he carried this tiny sliver of the insanity of war inside his head that he couldn't after 40, 50 years of being away from, or well, more than that, you know, what, 60 years, still couldn't rid himself of. And that it was 
if one of his kids was a traitor, there was this slight belief in him that he would have to kill us. And that was what he was terrified of. Not, he, he was terrified that we would be weak and it was weak people who for the sake of a bit of butter or bread, and maybe that's why he was weird about food too, but it was often, you know, because of those sort of things, people who would end up collaborating. Gave me very complex issues too when I, real, you know, piecing all of this together and realising, um, you know, my own inability to kind of govern myself about food and thinking, would I be one of those weak people? Would I be a traitor for a pound of butter? Terrifying to think, but... That's a classic kind of second generation question. Mm, it's all complicated by the fact that the reason why you come to a place, to Australia, is so your kids never have to go through that crap, isn't Well, it? that was exactly yeah. it. That's why my <laughs> father really didn't talk about it a lot, but there would be enough that you'd hear mm. that it would just kind of freak you out and you, you, I just had to know. I had to get to the bottom of it. It always made you worry. You said that you never really might have had the unconditional love of your dad. You sort of knew you had it from your mum, but not your dad. But it, it did become apparent when you finally came out to your family, to your mum and dad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was n nearly outed by this women's magazine, surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> in the 90s, this woman, she was a real toe cutter, this interviewer. And um, she was determined to get out of me, you know, the prize, which was the confession that I was gay. Weeping over your pasta. Yeah, yeah. She kept pushing the wine glass towards me, trying to weaken me. Um, little did she know I had been trained by an assassin. <laughs> I didn't crack. Um, and um, she... Um... <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't fold under questioning. No, That's what I didn't. your father wanted to know exactly, about Exactly, I didn't. Yeah. Now I realise now. Um, uh, <laughs> I'd always wondered what I would do if someone just flat out asked me, you know, are you gay? And this woman, you know, she was hedging around. She said, there are rumours, you know, one of the rumours is that you're homosexual. How do you feel about that? And this extraordinary sang froid came over me and I was cool for possibly the only time in my life. And, um, and I said, oh, I don't care. And she said, oh, really? I said, no, really, I don't care. Um, and um, then I went home and cried and <laughs> was terrified because... Um, you know, in the early 90s, which is when this was, um, if, you, if you were outed, it was a career ender, you know. Um, it, the chances that I could have had the career that I've had, um, had I been outed, I'm, I'm... And I'm not stupid about reading events and I'm pretty certain it, it would not have gone well for me and work is enormously important to me. You know, it's, it's very much... Um, it's not an ancillary thing. It's like a core element of who I am. So for me to be in a situation where I couldn't do my work would have been crippling for me. Um, so it was a very difficult conundrum to have, a very difficult dilemma. Um, but then I went home because I thought, oh, shit, I'm going to be out. I'd better tell my mum and dad. Um, so I went home, I got my brother, Barb was away at the time, and I, I told my brother, and he was gorgeous. You know, he said, I'll be there for you and, you know, if they attack you, I'll defend you and, you know, <laughs> not physically attack, you know. What, the Polish um, assassin? Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, um, and they were gorgeous. They were gorgeous. And then we all sort of cried and hugged and, um, and afterwards, um, as I say in the book, my only, you know, the, the great gift I, have, I had was that I realised then my parents' unconditional love and my only regret was that I'd ever had to doubt it. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Magda Sabansky.